first year I played football, um, I played running back. I went out and scored like, you know, 50 touchdowns in a year. Our team went undefeated all the way to the championship game, and I just kind of knew uh, then that football was a possible avenue for success for me. Going into my ninth grade year, I'm introduced um, to marijuana, I'm introduced to alcohol, I'm introduced to uh, sex. This is a 14-year-old kid uh, dealing with this stuff, and I didn't have a father figure around to teach me, you know, what all that meant. All I had was to look to were the guys in the streets, which was drug dealers, guys who had criminal records, and you know, that was my heroes, you know. I was looking up to those guys. So I just figured I was supposed to do what they did. I wanted to show them that I wasn't scared, that I wasn't uh, afraid to be a bad boy or whatever. I just wanted to impress them. I tried to jack um, another kid for his wallet. I tried to steal his wallet in the hallway, and I ended up getting in trouble and getting um, expelled from school. I remember my mom calling me on the phone and just hearing her brokenness when she answered the phone. You know, just like, DeMario, what have you done? And when she said that, it was almost to the point of, you have messed up your life. And I remember uh, being out running the streets with some of my friends, and we were breaking in cars. I punched the window, and I cut my arm up, and I have this uh, serious gash in my arm. And I felt like this was the first time I heard an audible voice from God. And he said, that's strike number two. The first strike was you getting kicked out of school. The second strike is you almost killed yourself tonight. If it would have been a few inches down, I could have gashed my wrist and died that night. It scared me to the point of, from the rest of my junior and my senior year, I cleaned up my act. I get to college and, you know, I've been cleaned up my act, but the fruit of my life still isn't changed. I get back and I'm all of a sudden I'm at this college and now I'm a small fish in a big pond. So I feel like I gotta prove myself all over again. So I go back to drink and I go back to smoke and I go back to partying and I land myself in jail. We stealing groceries out of Walmart. And I just remember looking around and like, Whatever I'm trying to do with my life, it isn't working. I had a chance to make it out, and now my coach can take my scholarship and I'd be sent back home. And I, and I messed up my opportunity before I even played a snap on the field. Fortunately, the coach did not kick me off the team. He gave me another chance. Because a little while later, our team chaplain, who I'd been going to Bible studies with, he started to spend time with me in the Word. He was talking about, you know, these radical ideas that I had never even thought about. And then he started to show me in the Bible that matched exactly what he was saying. And I never had looked at the Bible in that light. A, a good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. And he was talking about, this is talking about your heart. So my whole theory with God was, at the end of the day, God, you know I got a good heart. Well, this was showing me that I had a bad heart because nothing but bad fruit was coming from my life. But then he told me something that was reassuring and encouraging. He said, God will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And that night I went home and I was scared and I just prayed. It was the most sincere prayer I had ever prayed. I said, God, I need a new heart. That's all I said. God, I need a new heart. And the next day I was hoping that everything would change. I woke up and by the end of the day I was doing a lot of the same stuff I had been doing. And I went to him and I was like, man, you said that God would give me a new heart if I asked. He said, if you ask for a new heart, God will honor it and God will give it to you. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but he's going to give it to you. The message started to resonate. And I started to understand why Jesus had to die on the cross. He had to pay for those sins. And until we get a new heart, we can't fix what's coming out of us. And that God wants to come inside of us and clean us so that he can draw us back to himself. And, and it was like he was taking the scales off my eyes. At that moment, he removed the taste of alcohol from my mouth. He didn't remove marijuana and sex right then. But I said, God, you're the Lord of my life. And I'm going to choose to serve you when you want to move these things, you will. He did. A little bit later, um, he removed marijuana, and then uh, I was in an imperial relationship for five years. God broke it. He was like, it's time to get out of this. And I got out of that relationship. For two years, I walked in purity. I dated my wife, and then we were married a year and a half later. And that was the first time I'd ever did a relationship the right way. And to say that I've done that now, and then look at the, the benefits of uh, a blessed relationship and our marriage of after four years and our, our beautiful children just to see that the fruit that's come from it you just understand God is a God of order and when we do things in his order he can bless them more I let go and I said God I'm trusting you I don't know where you're gonna take me and he's brought me closer and closer to him Demario, isn't that a great story 
I, you're not going to see him probably today play. He's with the, the Jets. But I love, I love his story. I, I, I do. I, I like it for several reasons. Uh, a linebacker. I like it because... He, he dealt with some struggles uh, in his life. But even in the midst of those struggles, God used people and their unique roles to help him bring him to the place that God designed for him to be. I, I think about a single parent home and what it must have been like to be raised in that, that world. And many of you know it or a divorced family, and, and how his mom, not perfect, but did her best to, at some point, raise him uh, in, in a godly way, and, and you know, probably brought him to church on a regular basis. and Not perfect, but she did her best, and, and I love how God uses that. I, I love how, how God uses a coach, you know, to, to give him a second chance. And, you know, sometimes this is the struggle. We've been talking about this, this thing called simplifying our life. Sometimes we want what somebody else has instead of wanting what God designed us for. And I think of that coach who most likely probably wanted to be in the NFL wanted to be somebody else, but realized at some point that God had wired him, gifted him to be a coach. But, but, but get this, but that God used that coach in his own unique way to give him a kind of a second chance. Does that make sense to you? Or how God raised up someone like a chaplain and just to speak truth and say, hey, listen, you've got this thing confused. You think you have a good heart, but your actions don't line up with what you say is happening. And, and so just to give a little, a little truth and say, hey, listen, you know, a good fruit or a good tree produces a, you know, a good life, produces good fruit. A, a bad tree, tree produces bad fruit. And so if your life is producing some bad stuff, go back to the tree, go back to the root, go back to the heart. But... Church, I want to talk to you about simplifying your life, if you will, by using the gifts that God has given to you where you are and not necessarily the gifts that God has given to somebody else where they are. God certainly gifted Demario as a football player, and I thank God that he allowed himself to say, you know what, man, I got to keep pursuing this route, even though he was tempted to often try to fit in with the other peers that he knew or the things that other people were doing. But to see the grace of God continuing in his life to say, hey, listen, this is, this is what I designed you for. That's what I want to talk about is simplifying our life by being a part of God's team and finding the place that God has wired you to be. Let me put it this way. God calls, or God calls us all to do the best that we can and what he leads and what he gifts us to do. This is loving God and this is loving people. God calls you and I to do the best that he's wired us to be, to do. We often make life very difficult or complex because we put on the weight or the pressure of what everyone else is doing or their role, and we're kind of like, I wish I could do it like them, or I wish I had that gift. And the whole time God is saying to you, I never designed you that way. I designed you to be you. You have to be the best you that you can be. And when you do that, loving God and loving people, with that, life becomes a lot less complicated, a lot less stressful, and you will find a new level of freedom and simplicity in just being you. Amen? The verse that we've been using for the last few weeks is in Matthew 22, verse 37. It says this, 
Jesus is responding to the religious leaders of the day and there was laws and rules and regulations and they were trying to do all these different things and it was just this weight and Jesus said, listen, hey, listen, this is what everything comes down to. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we've been talking about trying to simplify our lives by just focusing on, on loving God and loving people. Just focus on two things. One of the reasons that I love, I love football, uh, needless to say, isn't because the Vikings make it to the Super Bowl very often, although I did hear someone cheer on the Vikings, God bless you for next year. Um, but I love football because for me, it's probably one of the better analogies, if you will, or metaphors for the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there's various roles. We, there, there's different things that we're supposed to do. Let me go back to football. In football, you have a coach. You have some linemen. You have some, you have some people in football that, that are quarterback or, or, or defense. Here's, here's part of the problem. A good running back. Sometimes we see a good running back. What is the key? The key component of a great running back. Anybody? Yeah, a great line, a good line. If you don't have a good offensive line, you've got a terrible running back no matter how great he is. Right? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. I'll coach. We can coach today. We'll just talk is what you should say. Anyway, so you've got, you've got different parts of this team. And so you've got a running back and a quarterback and coaches and, and, and people that prepare the field and defensive linemen. And, and we have all these parts. And what makes a winning team a winning team is not any one individual. It's the team playing as a team. And there is no better metaphor that I know of for what makes the kingdom of God or a healthy church a healthy church. It's the church playing together as the team with individual gifts, individual talents, individual personalities coming together to say, hey, we're going to do this as one team. That's why I love football. That's why I love it. The fact is the Bible is clear that we are part of a team. There are no solo players, no solo Christians. It doesn't exist. Let me give you a few verses. Pull out your notes if you would. There's a few verses I'd like you to look up uh, this week, if you would. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 says this. The body is a unit. It is comprised of many parts. And although its parts are many, they all form one body. So hey, listen. The body, the body of Christ is a unit. And so there's many parts, but every part working together, doing what they're supposed to do, the hand, the eye, the ear, whatever it is, every part coming together forms a healthy body. Anytime one part of that body doesn't come together, we have what? Less than a healthy body. Does that make sense? If you're watching online, hey, I'm glad that you're watching online. I'm glad that you're joining us. But how many know that we need you here because you're part of our body? Amen? Yeah. We, we need you here. And so I'm glad that you're watching, but we, we need you here because we need you to help us to be the people that God has quiet, wants us to be. You're part of the body of, of Christ. Again, sometimes what we do is we... Sometimes we look at other parts of the body or what other people do and we, we, we get our eyes focused on what they're doing and instead of just simply saying, well, God, what are you calling me, me to do? How do I be the best thumb that I can be? How do I do that? And church, just listen, when we focus on, if you will, being the thumb, do you know how much less complicated life becomes? When you're not worrying about being a finger or a toe or an ear or an eye, you just get to be a thumb? I'm telling you, most of the conflicts that you have in your life, whether it be with your marriage or in or work or wherever, social media, most of your conflicts that you have, I bet come from this, 
that it's somebody, you or somebody else, trying to help you to be somebody that God never required you or wanted you to do. It's often miss or unmet expectations for you or for somebody else that creates conflict. If you just worry about you being the part that God wants you to play in the kingdom of God and let other people worry about their part, that they're supposed to play in the kingdom of God, you're going to find a healthy, healthy body. Let me give you a few more verses. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's workmanship, in other words, God's intimate creation, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So that God has prepared something for this time, for this moment, for 2018, for you to do at the beginning of time. What is it that he's calling you to do? What is he calling you to be? Matthew 28, 19 says, Go, therefore, Make disciples of all nations. We call it the great commandment or the great commission. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and I am with you. So we're all called into ministry, right? We're all full-time ministers reaching people for Christ. Your job, your place, your vocation is just a tool to help you reach people and get them discipled and growing in Jesus. That's our job. So here's what I want to do. We, we have done a, a class for the last few years. We call it Discovering Your Ministry. Uh, and what we've done with it is we've tried to help people <coughs> find what we call their shape or their gift set, if you will. To, sometimes we struggle with, you know, I'm just not sure what I'm supposed to do. And, and sometimes we can get caught in that. And so we, we just... we wrote up this class, shape, uh, comes from Rick Warren, about how do, you, how do you kind of find out how God's wired you and help, help you people to find their place in ministry. And so I want to take just a few moments, the next 15 minute, minutes this morning, just to help you kind of walk through some stuff uh, together, to help you find out what's your place, what's the role you may have on the team, and, and how has God inqui- equipped you to be, to be a part of that. But So if you pull out your notes again, the first thing is this. A shape. I'm going to give you what they mean right away. Uh, when you look at S, S means spiritual gifts. So in your notes, it's spiritual gifts. H, H stands for your heart, your heart or your passion. So when you look at your shape for ministry, what are your spiritual gifts, and what's your heart? What's your passion? A is your abilities. A is your abilities. P is what's your personality. And E, what is your experience? S, spiritual gifts. H, what's your heart or your passion? A is your abilities. P is your personality. And E is your experience. All those form together to help us figure out how God may have wired us. So when we look at spiritual gifts, write these verses down if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, and those other ones. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. Just a few verses to talk about spiritual gifts. I gave you a couple tests in your notes to look up. I think one is gifts.churchgrowth.org. Do you have that one, I think, in your notes? And then there's another one called... um, arkchurches.com backslash disc. And then there's another one called spiritualgifttest.com. I don't know which ones I put in your notes. But take some time this week and study and look it up. Look up the verses. Look up the spiritual gifts. If you've taken the test before, take it again. And let me just warn you a little bit. Maybe this isn't a warning, but maybe it's a heads up. If you're from a different tradition... Some of you have been taught that the gifts have ceased, that you know, God doesn't speak anymore through people, that he only speaks through the Bible and everything else is closed, that miracles have stopped, that healing has stopped. That's just junk. Amen. I mean, I would encourage you, just do the first few chapters of Acts, and over and over again, you're going to see this is promised for you and for all the generations to come. God still works like he did yesterday. He still works today. He still heals and restores. He still delivers. He still gives words of knowledge and insight. 
So listen, when you look at your spiritual gift test, make sure that you're using one that includes all the gifts, not just some of the gifts. Does that make sense? Amen. And so just be aware of that. And I, I, I looked at these. Some, some do a good job, not such a great job. But the key, listen, here's the key to the gifts. Sometimes we get it backwards. You often will discover your spiritual gift through ministry. You'll often discover a spiritual gift through ministry or trying something more than discovering your ministry through your gift. And we get it backwards. That's the hard part with gift tests sometimes because sometimes we're like, I'm taking this test and it says something like, um, do you enjoy seeing people get healed? Of course I do. Like who doesn't, right? But the problem is, the problem is, is if you never have the faith to pray for someone to get healed, you may have a gift of healing, but have never stepped out in ministry to see that gift come to pass. Does that make sense? That's where team ministry comes in, is that sometimes you've got to step out in some areas that you're not used to stepping out so that the gift that God gave to you can be manifested and it can be used in that place. But if you're waiting for things to come to you, and then it's not going to happen. So you've got to step out and you've got to try some stuff. So look at those gifts. But then step out and try some things. A few of the gifts that you're going to find, uh, one we call what we'd call communication gifts. Again, I'm not going to go through all these. There's plenty of places uh, that you can look at these up. But communication gifts would be like maybe preaching, evangelism, missions, apostle, which would be like church planting or prophecy. You don't have to be a full-time licensed ordained minister of the Assemblies of God to be leading a church or to evangelize or even to speak. Amen. You just got to say, okay, God, man, there's something stirring and I'm willing to give it a shot. Now, if you got saved yesterday, you're probably not going to preach tomorrow, at least from here. <laughs> Number two, there's gifts that educate God's people, like teaching. If you're teaching in a school system, you probably have a gift of teaching. And... When God gives you a gift, oh, here we go. When God gives you a gift, we're all as believers in full-time ministry, and so there's no secular world, sacred world. There, you know, if you're a believer, your whole life is, 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 is sacred. Your whole life is spiritual. So this whole junk about sacred and secular, get rid of it. If you're a believer, your life is sacred. Your life is spiritual no matter what you do. So use your gift set in a spiritual context, whether you are teaching at Escanaba or Gladstone or Bark River, wherever it might be at the college, but use that gift set wherever you are. Amen? Amen. Let me go on. Give me a few more. Wisdom. Uh, educate. Man, we need some wise people. That God gives you supernatural wisdom, discernment, gifts of knowledge. There's gifts of, that demonstrate God's love, like gifts of service, gifts of mercy. Some of you, man, some of you, you can get hurt a hundred times, and you just, man, God's given you grace to just have mercy on people. I like people with mercy, you know what I mean? Because I fail so much, I just got to kind of come up to them. They're like, oh, pastor, you're okay. Thank you, gift of mercy person. Thank you. <laughs> but the church needs it. We need it. Hospitality. Shepherding. Some people have the gift of giving. Some people can make funds, and they love to give. Like, that's a gift. There's gifts that celebrate God's presence like music and craftsmanship and intercession and healing and, and miracles. There's gifts that support like leadership and administration and faith. There's no way you could write all those down, I know. But my encouragement to you is to don't just, don't just assimilate you know, what we share from the pulpit, but go home and open up the word of God and read it and dig in and find out what God is leading you to do. My job is to equip you, but your job is to get equipped. Amen? Amen. So this week, make that your goal. Hey, I'm going to look these tests up. I'm going to see where I'm at and find out if, if I'm, am I making my life more complex than what God designed it to be? 
Am I putting more on myself than what God designed? Am I trying to be somebody I'm not? Let me go on. Number two, first is spiritual gifts. The second one is your heart or your passions. I have found that spiritually each one of us has a unique heartbeat for ministry. Um, There are many things that I'm passionate about, but it doesn't mean you're going to be passionate about it. Uh, Let me talk to married couples for a moment. Just because you're passionate about one area doesn't mean that your spouse also has to be passionate about the same area. Don't nudge each other. I'm just telling you. If you're married... Let your, spouse be thing, let your spouse be passionate about things that they're passionate about. You be passionate about things you're passionate about and see how God molds those together in a healthy marriage. If you're a follower of Christ, this is those that really have a gift of evangelism, this is tough for, for you and I sometimes. Um, I, I, I love reaching people. You love reaching people. And like, you know, there's not enough. Like everyone, every person you meet, I believe, should have some kind of sense of moment where they make a decision. And so when I look to somebody that isn't like, when's the last time you led someone to Christ? And they say, a year ago, I'm like, what? Because I'm, that's my, part of my gift set. That's part of my passion. And so be careful that your passion is your passion and God uses that, but make sure that you don't try to put that in somebody else. That's what makes life difficult and complex. So how do you find out your passion? How do you find out the things, how you're wired? How, how do you find out? Let me, let me give you a couple steps to do this week. The first one is list and describe your accomplishments since childhood. What did you enjoy doing? For some of you, you have to go way back. For other ones, not so much. But what are some things that you enjoy doing over your life? And before you think about that, let me say something else with, with heart and passion. Sometimes you're just called to serve. If you're a parent and you have young children with dirty diapers, I don't know anybody that's passionate about changing diapers. Anybody here, that's your passion. You love changing diapers. You're like, right? But you do it because that's just the place that you're in your life. That's, you're called to serve. There's many places we're just called to serve. If you have children and are in, at New Life and they're part of the nursery or preschool, you're, you're asked to serve in nursery or preschool. It may not be your passion, but that's where you're at in life, right? If you spill coffee, <laughs> your passion may not be to clean it up, but that's kind of what you're called to do. Make sense? So find your places to serve. Anyway, let me go keep going on. So step one. Listen, describe your accomplishments since childhood. This is going to take you a while. It takes our group a long time for them to go through some. But so let me help you out, uh, just giving you some of the things that I've worked through over the last week in writing this up. When I, when I was younger, I enjoyed putting on carnivals uh, for kids. We did that for a few years. We built all these things in our house, and we had kind of a carnival. I can never figure out why. I just enjoyed doing it. I looked back over my life and I realized that, you know, I did a lot of sales from like second grade on. I was very good at it. Anybody remember Jump Rope for Heart? Yes. Jump Rope for Heart, we did this deal. You had to jump and you had to raise pledges. And for some reason, I did it for a couple of years. <coughs> and when they did it, they would give you a reward if you raised this much funds or this much funds. I was just very good at raising funds. I was a hard worker. But when I did it for the two years, they had to give me everything, like the jumpsuit, the sweats. For you that don't know what a jumpsuit is, the jumpsuit, sweats, sweats, full sweats. They had to give me that. And then a Walkman, you know, like, again, some of you don't know what a Walkman is anyway. <laughs> but I found out in my life, that's the thing I was good at. I used to sell cards door to door, and I really, I loved it. I used to sell Christmas cards, and I always did good at whatever I did. And, and so, but this is going to make sense, and it will for you in a moment as well. So look at your, some of your accomplishments in your life, and don't be over-spiritual about this. You know, don't, don't be, like, if you accomplish something, be okay with that. I always got straight A's. I didn't, but you, maybe you did. Why? Well, why did you always get, like, why were you always on the dean's list? I never was. So, so write down your list. What is your list? And number, the second part of that is this. When you look at that list, discover what motivated your heart. What motivated that? 
And so as I looked at my list, I'm like, okay, why, why did I love the carnivals? Why did I love sales? Why, I mean, why, why did I, why when I did jump rope for heart, did I keep doing it and keep doing it? And why, there's two things that, that I came to conclusion. The first one is this, is I really, I love people. I always have. I've always loved to en- engage people and encourage people and equip people and empower people. That's just something I've always, I've always been able to do and I've just really enjoyed it. Amen. The second thing I've learned in my life is I've always succeeded. I mean, I've always worked hard until I accomplished what I knew. Like there was no such thing as medi- mediocrity for me, right? There's one of my problems sometimes is perfectionism. I, it's either perfect or not at all. But that can be a gift as well. And so as you work through this stuff, you're going to say, okay, man, one of my passions then really can be summarized like this. I have a deep heart for people. I love to encourage, to empower people, to bring people to the best place. So no matter where I'm at, if I'm engaging people and empowering people and challenging, that seems to be a good fit for me. Does that help? But what about you? And you know there's a whole list. Maybe you love to design or develop. Maybe you're good at pioneering, starting things fresh and, and, and just getting them going. Maybe, that's, maybe you're good at operating and maintaining stuff. Maybe you look over your life and, you know, some of you, you love to wrench. You've always been able to wrench and wrench. And, and, but why is that? And so listen, this is so important because God has given you a passion and he's given you a heart. And if you don't use that for what he designed you for to use that for, you're going to be frustrated because your mindset's going to be, everybody wants me to do this or this, but God really wired me to do this. Does that make sense at all? It's simplicity in life saying, I'm loving God and I'm loving people with my heart, with my passions that God's given to me. And not to be ashamed of them, but you're going to see that list. Number three. Abilities. So I'm passionate about music. I've always loved music. <laughs> Scott never lets me sing. So there's the situation. You may have a passion for something, but just because you have a passion for something doesn't necessarily mean you have the ability for it. But here's a couple <clears throat> flaws, if you will, a couple myths. Some people think that if you weren't born with that ability, then you don't have it. That's not true. I really believe that I could be part of a worship team if I could just practice. I do believe that. But I'm not very good at practicing. I've done it before. I just don't stick with it real long. But you probably have abilities that you don't know you have because you haven't been able to test them or get them out or try some new areas of ministry because you've only stuck with kind of what you knew. Does that make sense? The second myth is skills that I, that I use at work are only usable in that environment. It goes back to that teaching thing. If you have a skill at work, it's meant to be a skill for the kingdom of God. It really is. Stop separating secular and sacred. But whatever God has gifted you with, recognize that's a kingdom of God gift, and you should be using it in some capacity for the kingdom of God. Amen? So how do I discover some of my abilities? Again, looking over your life, some similar things that come up. So for me, if I had a passion for helping people, and I was pretty good at communicating with people, there's some gifts that I had or abilities that I didn't realize. And let me tell you a story of what happened here. When I got hired in 2000 by Pastor Bob Durheim, uh, I got hired as a youth pastor. I, I thought maybe, maybe I could handle youth. I, I thought I could be okay, but he also said part of my job was to do children's ministry. And I'm like, no way. And I told him that. I said, listen, you know, I, I, I can't do children's ministry. There's no way I can do this. Um, and as a good boss should do, he said, no, that's what you're doing. That's what I did. <laughs> but I found out very shortly after, after about a year, that 
because I had some other passions and some other gifts set, I actually did quite well as a children's pastor. Not only did I do well as a children's pastor, I, I recognized that I really enjoyed it. And so, again, I'm just I'm trying to get us to stretch outside of the box. So, sometimes we, did, we put ourselves in these places of familiarity when God is trying to get us into new areas and gift sets that we discover that I have abilities that I didn't know I have, but we have to allow God to lead us in some new areas. Church, you're part of a team. You're part of the body of Christ. There's some things that God has for you in your life that you have to be able to say, hey, I've got to be willing to fail. I've got to be willing to try. I need to know what God has called me to do. When you do that, I'm telling you, you will find life simpler for you. Let me give you just some examples that maybe will help for you. Some of you love the English language. You love writing. You love your family. You enjoy studying. Maybe God's calling you to, you know, we try to do an insert once a month. It's just called equipping parents. It's not with us this week. It should be here next week. Maybe that's a gift set that you have you didn't know you had. Maybe, maybe you're gifted at counseling people and just didn't know it because you've never really met with somebody. You've never allowed yourself that place. Maybe, maybe you have a gift set of, of uh, you love doing research. You're very good. You, you love to study and to find the research, and you're good at finding deals. You've always got great deals. You know, maybe God's given you a gift you know, for like purchasing and, 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 and trying to save things. Is that, does that make, are you with me? And so just think outside the box. Don't, don't think in traditional terms, and especially in the church world of pastor and worship team and children's leader. I mean, think, think outside what we call the box and recognize that God has uniquely gifted you and you need to use that, whatever that looks like. Work on that this week, if you would. Number four, what is your personality? What is your personality? There is a thing called human metrics uh, in your notes. Your personality is simply saying, it isn't, again, this is where we can get in trouble. Your personality doesn't define you as much as it describes you. And there is a big difference. I have, anybody know who Stephen Furtick is? Stephen Furtick is a pretty good preacher. He's a pretty good musician too. But Stephen Furtick has a very unique personality. And as a pastor, if I try to be Stephen Furtick, I can never be as good as a Stephen Furtick as he can be. But if I try to be Stephen Furtick, and then the Jason Janish that God called me to be will never fulfill his purpose. Does that make sense? And so figuring out your personality helps you to really realize that as a teacher or as a, as a worker, whoever you are, that you get to be unique in who you are. But embrace that uniqueness. It's not an excuse, so it's not necessarily a way to, to define you, but it does help you to understand why you're wired you are and helps you to kind of get through some things. If you're very introverted, anytime somebody says, hey, let's all come together, you're like, no. But then you know that and you realize, well, this is what I'm naturally wired, but God says I need to be with the church. So, does that, so you, you, you work those things together. So discover your personality. It'll also help you if you're married to discover why your spouse is so crazy. There's a reason. So look that up, and then finally, finally, look up at your life experience. God often uses your pains, your education, the things that you've gone through as a platform for future ministry. If you've gone through hurts, you've gone through addictions, don't let Satan just take a, a chain on you and hold you there. Instead, let it be the platform that God uses for the ministry that God will call you to. Redeem it. Redeem it. If you were hurt, as, if you were hurt, if you were, if you were, went through difficult times, redeem those moments. Don't let Satan have another one of those moments. Use it for God's kingdom, for God's glory. Expose it, show it, celebrate what God did in the midst of it and through it, and in turn, what God can do in other people's lives if they will just, you know, give control to God. Amen.
So your shape, spiritual gifts, your heart, your passion, your abilities, your personality, and your life experience, what you've gone through, all help each of us to be a unique part of the team, unique roles that we have, all but all of us using those helps us to be the healthy body of Christ that God desires. There is a card in front of you. Um, I think it's called NL Serve Team. If you're, if you're still not involved, find a place to get involved. Find a place to get involved. And try something new. I mean, be faithful where you are, but don't misunderstand me, but be okay to try something different. Just tell them, hey, you know, I, I don't know if I can do this, but this might just work. It's what God's leading me to do. Can I, can I give it a shot? Don't, don't be okay just kind of staying on the, on the sidelines. Amen? You grow together. You mature together when we serve together. Stand with me if you would.